In the second historical sketch on the American War of 1812, we will deal with the various phases and aspects and implications of this war. Now, in the previous episode, we showed that the foremost promoters of the war were the Western representatives in Congress, those who resented the few remaining fetters blocking the expansion of the recently formed United States into Native American territory. The fetters, or the obstacles, if you like, were the agreements with the English at the end of the War of Independence and the presence of the English in Canada. It is not that the British were particularly keen in defending the rights of the Native Americans, but it was in their interest to contain the expansion towards the West by the United States. For the British had already occupied what was then called the Oregon Territory on the Pacific coast, which included what is today British Columbia and the area which today constitutes the states of Washington and Oregon. Anyway, the Americans, led by the war hawk Henry Clay, much later to become president, felt that conquering Canada would be a snap. And to this purpose, they planned a kind of Operation Barbarossa before its times. You may recall that Operation Barbarossa is, of course, the invasion was the invasion of Russia by, by the Third Reich in World War II. Henry Clay, with the confident, with the confident language of assumed victory, said in Congress that the conquest of Canada is in your power. I trust I shall not be deemed presumptuous when I state that I verily believe that the militia of Kentucky are alone competent to place Montreal and Upper Canada at your feet. The debate was what to do with Canada once conquered. And the idea was to turn it into a colony with lesser rights, lesser rights than the states of the Union, which is a point of a philosophical interest in itself. For, if you recall, the War of Independence from England was waged on the idea that the Americans felt that they had lesser rights than the British. But, but let that go. The plan was a three-pronged attack. Attack on Canada. One would be aimed at Montreal, the other along the Great Lakes, in the Great Lake regions. The effort would be from Detroit east towards Lake Erie and then Lake Ontario. The third prong of the attack would consist of defeating and preventing the British Navy from interfering with the invasion. The administration, while Madison was president, chose Mr. William Hull to, to head the operation near Detroit. Detroit, who was founded by the French in 1701, and which means straight in French, straight, was a time, a time a village. And Mr. Hull knew that control of Lake, realized that control of Lake Erie was essential for any successful military operation near Detroit. And with British ships navigating nearby, he advanced, decided to advance toward Detroit by land. However, he used a schooner by the name of Cuyahoga to transport some sick soldiers, some supplies, and believe it or not, his trunk, which contained all the correspondence with the War Department. He instructed the schooner to sail to Detroit, except, except that it had to pass the schooner, that is, had to pass under the guns of a British fort. It is true that a formal declaration of war had not yet reached the British, but it, had, it, but, but it was unlikely that the British would not inspect a suspicious ship passing under their nose, which indeed they did, and which led to the discovery of the trunk. And when the major, the British Major Corporal Isaac Brock, Isaac Brock opened the trunk and found such a wealth of information, he acquired all the details that he needed to organize a defense. Unaware of this, and with the regiment, regiment of troops, Hull rode across, the, rode across the Detroit River and landed on the Canadian shore unopposed. From where he issued a declaration as follows. Inhabitants of Canada, you will be emancipated from tyranny and oppression and restored to the dignified station of free men. A kind of call for an orange revolution before its time. But ahead of the river shore there was a fort to be conquered and Mr. Hall failed to conquer it, though his forces outnumbered the, the fort occupant by two to one. 
Then came another bad news that the American outpost at the, on Mackinac Island, as you see here, an island that guarded the strait between Lake Huron and Lake Michigan, had surrendered to a combined force of British troops and Native Americans. In this instance, the American commander of Fort Mackinac didn't know himself that a war had been declared. Still, he was curious as to why all of a sudden traders and Native Americans suddenly stopped from coming to the island. And he sent someone to investigate, but it was too late. Outnumbered and outgunned by the oncoming British, Canadian and American soldiers, he had, he had to surrender. Now, let's turn our attention to the eastern side of the advance towards Canada. The Americans now fixed their sight on Quinston Height, Heights with the idea of occupying that strategic position. And this would be an advantageous, as I said, strategic point for commanding the river that ends in the Niagara Falls at Fort St. George, as you see in the map. General Brock, the same general who discovered that a war had been declared by capturing the trunk of the head of the American troops, General Brock galloped from Fort George to Queenstown through the Queenstown, Queenstown, area, Queenstown area. He arrived when the Americans were, were storming the place and the British were greatly outnumbered. He could, he could have given any number of orders to his to his soldiers, <clears throat> but the situation was urgent. If the, Americans, if the American position was reinforced, the battle would be lost. <clears throat> so up the slope, up the slope he went with his red coat, red coat and epaulets and the scarf that Tecumseh, the Native American hero, had given him. The British general was definitely, definitely a prominent target. He was struck twice and died, but the hill was recaptured. The next attack from the Americans came from Colonel Winfield Scott, who had ridden down from Niagara, as you see in the map. In the meantime, the Americans had once again recaptured Queenston Heights. But then the British Major General Chef Schiff advanced from Fort George with his garrison. The American general ordered the New York militia to cross the river and reinforce Scott's position but the American soldiers refused to leave the American soil. Therefore, Scott had to surrender. In that action, 300 Americans were killed and 958 taken prisoner. The British losses were 14, 14 dead and 70, 77, 77 wounded. Chef received a baronetcy for, having, for saving the day and Brock was made a Knight of the Order of the Bath night for, for his feet, both at Air Detroit earlier on, but he died before knowing of the honor that, had been re, that he had received. As for the second stage of the invasion of Canada, that is, the march on Montreal, this never came about for various reasons. All in all, on land, the liberation of Canada did not prove a success, which, in political style common today, caused the previous system, the previous confident, previously confident Henry Clay, who got the operation started, it, it caused him to say Canada was not the end but the means, the object of the war being the redress of injuries and Canada being the instrument by which that redress was to be obtained. Sound familiar? And if not, I suggest you read the Pentagon Papers on the Vietnam War. Things were bet went better at sea, however. In 1812, there were four types of ships, as you can see, try to illustrate. The sloop, the brig, the frigate, and the man of war. And roughly speaking, apart from the size, the ships were rated by the number of guns that they could carry. In the instance, in the instance that we describe here, the American frigate Constitution was a 44-gun frigate, but actually it carried it carried 52 guns, that is, she had an eight guns overload. But why more guns were important? You may think that the answer is intuitive, but the reason had to do with the way naval battles were fought. When the only power available was the wind, the experience of the commander, and a good, a good dose of luck. Of crucial importance was how much iron they could, each ship could, could slam into the other, 
into the hull of the other ship when they were positioned side by side. The short-range cannons were called carronades, named for Caron in Scotland where they were first made. Clearly, having more guns firing at the enemy across, enemy's hull at close range would make the difference. And the naval duel I describe here took place in August 812 when the American frigate Constitution encountered, encountered the British frigate Guerriere. As the two ships approached, the Guerriere fired several shots at the Constitution, but after a well-aimed British broadside, this, this, this shot bounced harmlessly off the Constitution. A crew member allegedly said, Hooray! Her sides are made of iron. And this gave rise to the legend of old iron sides, familiar even today. The American captain of the Constitution, Hull, another Hull, waited to open fire when the two ships were only 25 yards apart. And the effect on the British ships, the Guerriere, was devastating. Followed a close-range fight in which the two ships became entangled and the masts of the British ships were brought down. The British frigate Guerriere had to surrender, or as it was said in, um, in the language of the in marine language of the time, the Guerriere had to strike the flag. By itself, the loss of one frigate, British one frigate, was not important, but it had an immense psychological impact both on the United States and in England. And it had also important political ramification. The victory galvanized U.S. voters in favor of a wartime president, and that helped President James Madison to win a second term, gaining the swing votes on the eastern side of the United States, New England, which formerly was, or at least the voters, the voters were, strongly against the war. There were two more victories at sea by the American Navy and one British, British frigate. The Macedonia was even brought into an American harbor as a prize of war. These naval victories lifted the American spirits, but equally heightened, at the same time, the British determination to turn her attention to North America. Still, the objective of annexing Canada remained as strong as ever for the Americans. And given the fiasco of General William Hull at Detroit, he was substituted by General Isaac Chauncey. What the defeated William Hull was right about, however, was the need to have a strong naval force on Lake Erie if the war was to be successful. And I refer to this the building of a fleet on Lake Erie due to an almost, almost comical event and an unbelievable mistake that influenced the most noteworthy naval battle on Lake Erie in September, in September 18, 800, 1813. To build a navy on a lake, the first question to answer is where are we going to build it? And to this effect, Chauncey sent a lieutenant to scout, to scout for a suitable location for a shipyard, and his name was Jesse Elliott, and he saw two British frig anchored near Fort Erie, as you see in the map. With a band of 650 sailors and taking advantage of the night, he ran onto the vessels and took their respective crews by surprise. One brig ran aground, but the other was captured, and the British brig became on the spot an American brig. But Elliott's main objective was to find where to build the new ships. In the meantime, while neither Chauncey, the general, nor Elliot, the lieutenant, knew anything about it, a Great Lakes merchant, or rather a lobbyist by the name of Dobbins, convinced Washington that the perfect place to build the ship on Lake Erie was Presque Hill Bay, near his home, near his home then, which was then the little village called Erie, Pennsylvania, today an important town. Washington approved the idea of the lobbyist, the idea of Dobbins, without consulting either General Chauncey or the Lieutenant Elliot. And when Elliot heard that he could not, he heard this choice, he could not believe his ears, because there was not sufficient water over the bar of the mouth of Preskill Bay to allow any large ship built there to cross the lake, into the lake. 
Elliot, as we say today, had an attitude. And uh, Chauncey, his, his boss, fearing a clash of tempers between Elliot and Dubbins, replaced him, Elliot, with another lieutenant by the name of Perry, who was also equally skeptical about the choice of location of the shipyard. Still, construction began of the two brigs, respectively named the Lawrence and the Niagara. Meanwhile, the British blockaded the area just outside, outside Presque Hill. Presque Hill. Then suddenly and without explanation, the British ships lifted the blockade. And rumor has it, rumor has it, that the active British commander by the name of Barclay had a dinner date with the widow at Port Dover on the other side of the lake. This was good news for the shipbuilder supervisor, who was now, as I said, was Perry. But when the ships were all well outfitted with guns and everything else, it was indeed proven that there, they, there wasn't enough clearance for the ships to cross into the lake. What to do? Fortunately for the Americans, there was an able shipwright available, available who used a system not different in principle from that used to lift the cruising ship Costa Concordia when it ran aground three years ago in Italy. And the system made use of what they called the camels, which were two wooden boxes, uh, each 50 feet long, 10 feet wide, and 8 feet deep, that were placed on each side, on each side of the ship. When filled with water, the boxes sunk to the bottom, and heavy, then they put heavy logs were run through the lower ports of the ship and placed on top of, of the camels, of the boxes. And the, when the water was pumped out, pumped out of the camels, they rose up toward the surface, lifting the ship so as to make it, to make it float. Even so, it was easier said than done, and they had to remove all the guns and other heavy equipment to ensure that. Even with the camels, the ship may float into the lake. In the end, they succeeded, and shortly later, shortly later, the British and American fleet met in the middle of the lake, and the American won a resounding, American won a resounding victory. It's called the, lake of, the Battle of Lake Erie on September 13. Of 1813. But the key to the control of the operations for the invasion of Canada was the isthmus, as we saw before. And you see here the isthmus between Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, of which the most noteworthy geographical features it is or are, of course, the Niagara Falls. And here we come across another of the many episodes that, when the dust of history settles, are remembered about the war more than the reasons for the war itself. Earlier on, we saw that there had already been a battle at Queenston Heights during which the English General Brock was killed and posthumously decorated for his bravery in defending the position. After that battle, the Isthmus remained a territory subject to what today we would call guerrilla warfare. Warfare complicated by the fact that in both sides of the conflict, the combatants spoke English so it was difficult to know who was fighting for whom. Still, the Americans wanted to put an end to all this harassment, and with much secrecy, they moved, uh, as secrecy as they could master, they moved, uh, they, they moved from Fort George to Queenstown to find weaknesses in the British line. Now, it just so happens that a Mrs. Laura Secord, a 13-year-old, Queenstown housewife, mother of five, was there, and her husband was bedridden after a wound received during the earlier battle when the British General Brock, as I said, was killed. Now, on the evening, on the evening of June 22 of, of 1813, she left Queenstown on foot ahead of the American troops and walked almost 20 miles to warn the British brigadier by the name of Fitzgibbon that on the oncoming of the, to warn him about the oncoming attack. Fitzgibbon had established a post near the Beaver Dam on a creek called Twelve Miles Creek. And this Miss Laura Sicord was captured by the Kaunawaga England Indians, excuse me, that fought with the British and they, and the, this Indian, the Native Americans, brought her to, to Fitzgibbon. At first he was a skeptical. And when no Americans arrived, Laura Secord was questioned at length to verify 
her loyalist, her loyalist credentials, we may say. But suddenly, a Frenchman by the name of Ducherne, or Ducharme, who commanded the British Indian allies, raised the alarm that the Americans were near. In brief, in brief, very shortly. The, Kaiwa, the Kawahaga, Kai, excuse me, Kanawaga and the Mohawks, the other natives fighting with the British, the British surrounded the Americans. The American lieutenant, by the name of Bustler, had no choice but to surrender. And with, with the, said with, with the, the British Fitzgibbon, all these names, not a shot was fired on our side but any, by any but the Indians. They beat the American detachment into a state of terror, and the only share I claim is taking advantage of a favorable moment to offer them, the Americans, protection from the tomahawk and the scalping knife. But another British officer observed later that the Kanawaga fought the battle, the Mohawks got the plunder, and Fitzgibbon got the credit. And this was the Battle of Beaver Creek. But the fame of Fitzgibbon was eclipsed by the legend that grew about Laura Secord's walk. There were even claims that she drove that she drove a milk cow part of the way in an effort to conceal to conceal the real purpose of her walk. Now, another noteworthy event, not so much for itself, but for the consequence it gave rise to, was the burning of Canada's capital, which at the time was called York, located where today is Toronto. We have seen that the Americans' plan included a three-pronged action, one from Detroit up, the second from Niagara east, and the third from on, up the St. Lawrence with the aim of capturing, capturing Montreal. As far as advancing towards Saint, the St. Lawrence, the idea was at first to raid Kingston, Ontario, as you see on the map, but the American generals felt that attacking Kingston was too risky, so they settled on attacking York. York was poorly defended because it had no strategic value. Still, the attack on York historical, is historically interesting for two separate reasons. For the name of the, the brigadier general who commanded the attack, and for the consequences that, le, that, that the attack had later on. The commanding general was Mr. Zebulon Pike. Zebulon, Zebulon who? You may ask. Zebulon Pike was originally an explorer and he had been charged with following the Mississippi River up to its source. And then he headed west with a force of soldiers and this was part of a scheme that he had concocted with a double agent by the name of General Wilkinson, which along with an ex-vice president of the United States, Aaron Burr, was planning to carve an empire for the two of them. The project did not succeed. Aaron Burr was tried for treason, but was saved for political reasons. And I mention this name because Aaron Burr, earlier on, had killed in a duel Alexander Hamilton, whose image you will quickly recognize when you look at a $10 bill today. Anyway, Pike was captured by the Spaniards and treated as a spy, which really he was a spy, his maps when record were confiscated and were returned to America only in 1907. Still, Zebulon Pike ended up carving a name for himself in history, having given his name to Pike's Peak in Colorado, the highest mountain in the lower 48 states. Unlike the Mount Blanc in Europe, or the Matterhorn for that matter, you can even get to Pike Peak by sitting, sitting comfortably on a train. Our explorer Pike, now turned Brigadier General, stormed York, now Toronto. As the forces were advancing into town, burning and looting, Pike sat on a tree stump to question a Canadian sergeant. sergeant. At that point, it happened that the retreating Canadians blew up an underground ammunition storage. And this created an explosion of massive proportion with rocks and shells and shrapnel falling all over the place. Pike turned his back to protect himself, and at that point a huge boulder lifted by the explosion hit him on his head and back. And so it happened that the explorer who climbed the peak that now bears his name was killed by a rock on the shores of Lake Ontario. And see how history is full of unexpected, unexpected strands. 
In the next and possibly the last episode of the War of 1812, we will cover how and why the British stormed and burned the capital Washington and what were the practical consequences of the War of 1812, over and above the annihilation of any remaining hope by the American natives to salvage any part of their own land. I thank our crew director, Cat Iverson. Thank you all for watching, and until next time, I am Jimmy Molia for Historical Sketches. Good night. <laughs>